there was three in each engine room on one watch. There was a senior uh, motor machinist over me. I was a third grade motor machinist. And then we had an electrician on the upper level. And in our engine room, we had two V16 engines for propulsion on the ship. And there was two more V16s in the after engine room. And we also had an eight cylinder diesel for light and, light and power on, in our engine room. And uh, it's funny now, but the two guys that I stood watch with, they had a tendency to get seasick very, very easily. So the electrician, he was the first one, he would sit on top and he'd put a bucket between his legs and then if it got a little rougher, that bucket would get away from him and there was about a lip like that on the upper deck hit that bucket, that would come down. My buddy, see that, he was done. And so I was running that engine room by myself and you had to take the compression and temperature of each cylinder on them 216 diesels every hour plus the eight and keep everything else going. And then they had what they call a hear, hear. <laughs> You couldn't hear yourself think, but you get in there and you're supposed to hold your ears shut and supposed to get your orders. And that always worried me that I would get, get something screwed up because it was really hard to understand them down there. But uh, we, we did all right. We, uh, we stood watch, two four-hour watches a day, four hours on and eight hours off. And sometimes you had GQ, then you would stay on <laughs> regardless if it was eight hours or 10 hours. And sometimes you got pretty hungry yet because it did last that long. They had these wolf packs out in the Atlantic and those old German commanders were pretty sharp. They would sit in the, below the water, cut everything off, and then the, your convoys would come over and then they would come up and they'd loosen some torpedoes they wouldn't care what, they had to hit something because the ships would zag, zigzag so many minutes, minutes in one direction and so many minutes in the opposite direction. And uh, we were the flagship, we were we had what they call uh, uh, pivot control. We were, we were out in front of them and supposed to pick, pick these guys up, but if they're sitting, they got everything turned off, you don't, you don't pick anything up. But they, uh, they sank quite a few ships like that. And then when they would get done, they would just do the same thing, shut everything off and just drop down. Well, we'd pick them up once in a while. There's a few of them sitting out in the Atlantic, didn't make it. They fired uh, what they call 13 charge, depth charge patterns. And uh, if you spot it, if they pick one up on sonar, it wasn't just one ship would shoot them. 13 charges at them. The next one would come by in a different direction and shoot. So finally we got credit, I think, for one and a half. We should have had two, but it didn't. But, and you never know how many other ones you heard or anything, but the idea is uh, they left you alone after that for a little while. But that was uh, pretty, it was pretty good duty. I, I loved it. It was, I never missed a meal. I never got sick sick a day in my life. and. <laughs> I, I loved it. But, uh, then uh, i trying to think what else would be interesting. Oh, our ship was in Brooklyn Navy Yard. We just got back from, I think, Europe. I don't remember all that. Anyway, I was in New York City on VE Day. And man, that was quite a celebration. And then, uh, uh, after that, we went back out in the North Atlantic and uh, all the subs, uh, there was about five German subs didn't, didn't surrender right away. But uh, our squadron was in on taking, capturing two of them. Now we, was, we didn't get to take them in, but one, uh, I think it was a DE-113, I think they took the sub in to Boston that they they put a, a, a little crew on there and took over. 
And I don't know what the number of the other one was, but they took one in up, I think, the Hal Scotia. They're in Newfoundland, they, you know, closest port to get, get them off. And then after that, the war was over. There was a gentleman came on our ship and he, well, I can't say exactly what I ought to call him, but he was a pain. And us, I mean, we worked together. We had that ship in tip top shape. Nothing would suit him. So I told my buddy, I says, it's time we get off of this thing. I says, uh, what do you think? He says, well, he says, I can eat the wrong stuff and get, get the hives. And I says, well, I think I can get off. I had what they called psoriasis. It didn't bother me. Had one spot on my leg, pharmacist made, okay. Transferred me off to the, we both got to go together. We went to uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital. That's uh, New Hampshire. And uh, we just stayed in there just to, so the ship pulled back out. <laughs> so then I, I took a draft. That's what they called it. I took a draft from uh, Boston then all the way to uh, San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge. What the heck they call that naval base? Uh, anyway, I took a draft of 15 guys. I had a take care of the meal tickets and see that they got on the train and all that junk and we got out there then we caught a ship it was broke broken down mess but it was taking a bunch of guys from the Atlantic and putting them out in the Pacific but they had uh, we had eats but uh, they had a major uh, what do they call that high pressure steam line the gasket blew, so they called my name and some of the other guys, and we didn't know what was up. We went up there, they wanted to know if we'd volunteer to help help change that. Went, yeah. But you, the wrenches were about that big, and the nuts were about like that. And uh, that gasket blew out, and we were just sitting ducks in the water, and there were still Jap subs running around. You know, the, the war was actually over, but, oh, I forgot to tell you, I was in... Boston when VJ Day was, that's what it, but that's when from Boston is when we went out there. And uh, well, we were lucky. We finally got in uh, Pearl Harbor and I, uh, I had enough points. I only needed one or two at the time you needed points to get out. It depended what you did and how long you did it and stuff like that. And I just needed a couple points so I got yanked off. Well, let me finish this other story. We, we uh, we changed that, we got the bolts out, and two of us would work it, one on top, one on the bottom of the nut, and there was eight of them around that. It was a pipe, about an 80-inch pipe. We got them out, got the new gasket in. Everybody says, how can you do that, don't it stick? It's a gasket made out of like, uh, oh, asbestos, and I don't know if you know what greasy asbestos is. It's uh, you don't see it anymore, but they used to use a lot of it around water pumps and that around this part of the country. But you get it out and you just slip a new one in. Well, we'd work about five minutes and you had to get out of there, man. You would, every pore in your body was open. And that's the first time I ever heard that. We couldn't drink any water. They had two doctors there watching us, and all we could drink was uh, grapefruit juice. Anything else, they said, you'd get the cramps so bad you couldn't stand it. So I don't know how much grapefruit juice. We drank a lot of grapefruit juice. We got, when we finally got it finished, I think instead of maybe 10 minutes, we were up there working maybe two minutes and you had to get out of there. It was, it was just get so weak finally you couldn't hardly lift that darn wrench. <laughs> but anyway, we got paid real good for that. We got a shower out of that deal and a real good meal which, uh, which, was, which was something big, rather than what everybody else was eating over there. So then I got to, I got to go with uh, Admiral to the mine fleet while I was in Pearl. I got stationed down there then because I only had two points to get out. And I got uh, in good spirits, or not good spirits, in good graces, I should say, with the captain. 
I had uh, seven or eight guys working for me, and all we did was we took care of the Jeeps, two limousines, a bus, a couple carryalls. This was the uh, admirals of the mine fleet in this place, and these guys would show for them admirals around, and uh, all the other ones, they would take the equipment out, and we'd keep it in good shape. And uh, I'd sit in my shack, assign them their jobs, one day here this old four striper captain came in and he opened the refrigerator up and he, he took a beer out and I said sir I says uh, if you don't mind I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't wouldn't drink that beer in here yet he says well why not I says because that's a rule I said I says I don't let anybody drink a beer until after four. Oh, he says that's your rule, that's the way we'll do it. And, he put, boy, and then we got, we got to be big buddies. He thought, oh boy, anybody talk up to a captain. <laughs> but anyway, he took me places that I never knew existed on that island. And uh, I got to go places that a lot of enlisted men didn't go. I was in one, he took me to uh, officer's club. Me and one other enlisted man out of maybe a hundred officers. And them officers all look down on you, know, wondering what in the world you're doing in there. That captain says, don't you worry, you just take any, order anything you want. And that's what we did. But I had keys and that for, he got me passes for everything. And uh, Norvin Kampschreiter, a local boy that ran Norv's here in Washington, he was a butcher down there in on Oaiea, they called it, uh, where their uh, mess hall and that was. He couldn't get no uh, meat saw blades. Well, I had a place, I, I got in that place, I guess it was, oh gosh, 15, 20 acres of egg surplus, they called it. Most of it brand new stuff. And then these salvage companies would come out and bid, and they bought it for maybe a nickel on a dollar well, you couldn't take everything out of there, but if I saw something I wanted, I could put in a requisition and gut it. But I saw that yeah, meat saw blades, two boxes happened to go over the fence. Accidentally, I don't know how we threw them that high, but they went over the fence. Went around, picked them up, brought them up to my buddy, Norman Camp Creator. He had his meat saw blades. Could, could he order them and order them? Couldn't get them. And here there was piles of them sitting there. But that uh, just goes to show you, <laughs> I, en I enjoyed being in the Navy. It had a lot of rough times and it had a lot of good times. And uh, I had to do it again, I would, I would. I uh, was supposed to be second class. I got the book out, out the house. I passed the test and everything. Navy froze, third class motor machinist instead of second. It would only mean twelve dollar a month raise at that time, but that was a lot of money. Uh, I don't know what else I can tell you. Oh, I'll tell you a deal that helped me with that captain. He wanted to take me along to Japan with him. He was going to be sent to Japan. I was a motor machinist. How he would do that, I don't know. He wanted to take me along with him to Japan, and he says, I'll see that you get to be a chief petty officer. I said, wow, <laughs> that's jumping up a few grades. I guess he could do it. But anyway, I says, uh, no, I says, I, I really don't want to. I said, Jim, I says, I'd like to get home for Christmas, if at all possible. I said, I haven't been there for three Christmases. And he says, uh, see what we can do. He says, I'll guarantee you, you won't get the fly. He says, all the officers and that are taking and that stuff. And he says, a lot of civilians, even that are over in the islands and that, they, they get first track at that. He says, I'll do the best I can do. Okay. He called me up. He says, I got you on a ship for the 9th of December. He says, good luck. So I got on that ship. We pulled in California, got discharged down at, in St. Louis <clears throat> at Lambert Naval Air Station at that time. 
I got off the train here in Washington at 7.30 Christmas Eve. Made it. And uh, I, uh, no, nobody, uh, they didn't know I was coming. Excuse me. I I almost hurt my mom. <laughs> she was so happy to see me. But uh, no, it's been a long time ago. So that's my naval experience. Anything else you need to know, or didn't you even start yet? Uh, no, it's perfect that you're like you remember so much. Let, let me see. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know? You're such a good storyteller. I just got like all like engrossed. Um, do you, what was the camp you trained at? Do I won? What? Um, what's, huh? Uh, what camp did you train or how did you? Boot camps did you attend? Pardon? Sorry. What boot camps did you attend? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, at wow. Farragut, Idaho. Oh, cool. Yeah. At the. Uh, I should have told us. I said we went in. I forgot to tell you where we went. I went to boot training at Farragut, Idaho, and from there I went to the University, University of Illinois. Oh, no, don't worry, no problems. Um, did you see combat? Pardon? Did you see combat? Quite a bit, anti-sub duty, that's pretty good, yeah. Sometimes uh, they uh, had, uh, when we took the ship, put it in commission, they had uh, what they called ash cans for depth charges, they were just around like a 30 gallon drum and they roll some off the fan tail and they'd shoot the other ones on the Y guns and then about I guess six eight months later they came along with the with the new type it looked like an aerial bomb it was a head to cage like the other ones but it was in the shape of a bomb the first ones they had to set them for depth the new ones came out they were uh, magnetic and depth. Well, the first time we used them, <laughs> and I'll never forget that, we were, we didn't know how they were gonna act. They must have been down the engine room, you don't know what the heck's going on. And man, we thought that ship was blown out of the water. And uh, there's one guy up on during GQ, there was an extra one in there, and uh, I'd look at my buddy, I said, maybe we better go on next deck. He says, no, no, there was water lines broken at, so we had some stuff. Uh, uh, it was like duct tape only, it wasn't duct tape, it was thicker and real sticky. And you could take that and wrap that around an oil line or a water line, small ones, and stop the leaks. So we, we got that done, and then we found out after that 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 sub was maybe only 20, 30 foot under the water, which wasn't much below on the bottom of our ship. And when them depth charges went off, <laughs> we went up in the air. <laughs> uh, it, it just done a lot of minor damage, but nothing to it. But uh, that, was, that was something. Nobody knew what, how they were going to act. That was the first time you ever hit anything. <laughs> I mean, they knew it hit something, it was magnetic, and they were, for depth, usually they, they fall maybe 100, 200 feet, didn't make any difference. So they knew something had to be pretty close on top of the water to, to set them off like that. But, yeah, the guy up on top, he was laughing. He, he came over the phone and he knew what was going on. But we didn't know down below. We just little peons, you know. <laughs> but, but if a sub would, torpedo would ever hit, one of them DEs that they would be gone, just like a destroyer. They, they were just a little smaller than a destroyer. And that's, uh, everybody, they get the wrong idea about this stuff. They call the escorts and that and destroyers. But your idea is these small ships, they protect the big ships. In other words, if you got an aircraft carrier here and you might have cruisers, battle wagons, you might have 10, 15 destroyers. Their job is to protect them. And if it means they take a torpedo instead of them bigger ships, they do it. 
I mean, they are they can't dodge this torpedo and let it hit a cruiser. I mean, that's uh, the way things are. Now we didn't have orders like that with uh, uh, the cargo ships, but if there would have been any other kind of ships with us bigger, it would have been our job to protect them ships. That's that's the way it goes. That's well, you go up the ladder. The bigger the ship you are, the more protection you got. The little you are, <laughs> you know, but you got to protect yourself. That's it. okay. I don't. What else? You said that you were um, you were there. You were on the shores in France on VE Day, or no? VE Day in New York. In New York, what was? How did you? How would? How did you react? How, was that an exciting time? Oh, <laughs> you, you couldn't hardly move. There were so many people running around. Women was grabbing you and kissing you. You remember that one picture they got? Well, there was that was like that thousands of times. And uh, there was uh, me and my buddy. We were out. We didn't. We weren't worried about eating. And then these two gals. Want to know if we'd want to go get something to eat? Well, we didn't. Oh boy, they took us to a fancy restaurant, and I could never eat mutton. When I went to boot camp, mutton steaks looked like a good, beautiful pork steak. And our guys were mess cooking, and I asked them to. They put one on my plate, and I asked them to get me another one, and put it under my hand, almost burned my hand. I cut that thing up, took one bite, out of the mess hall I was. I mean it. It made me throw up right now. So, went in this fancy restaurant, they had lamb. And I asked that lady, I says, I can't eat mutton. I says, is that lamb any good? Oh, that's delicious, she says. So, okay, I'll try that lamb. And it had, I bet, a little rind fat on it like that. I took a bite of that, same taste. I just absolutely couldn't eat it. I don't know. To this day, I couldn't never eat it. If you're not used to it, you don't even try it. It's, it's different, especially if you get a little little fat. But uh, no, then them girls they wanted us take us. They lived in White Plains, New York. I <laughs> said, so, Oh my God, we're not going anywhere. We gotta get back that. <laughs> we gotta get back to that ship. By midnight, we had to be on ship then. So, <laughs> oh. We'll guarantee you will have a lot of fun in White Plains. I <laughs> said, yeah, we'll have a lot of fun in the brig, too. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we uh, made it back all right in time. And then the next one was up, like I said, got in Boston. And uh, I come, we came out of the Portsmouth Naval Hospital up to that Boston Naval Receiving Station. And uh, VJ Day and... Uh, that was named. That was crazy up there. We <laughs> riding. I even got to ride a fire truck that day. But uh, everybody was celebrating. There was no so many people running around. That vehicles couldn't move. If they had a fire or something, I don't know how they'd ever got that vehicle out of that mess. But after that, then I went. Like I say, I went headed west. So that's that's about the story of my life in the service. Like I said, I I did all right. I behaved myself. I never got in any trouble. A couple of times I drank a few too much. I took care of a, an Indian. Uh, he he was on our ship. Indians can't drink. Believe me. He would go out and he would. It didn't take much. He'd drink whiskey and oh, he'd get mean as heck. So. I'd see him somewhere. One time I even I got him away from the SPs and I hit him on the arm and Marcus. Yeah, what? I says, What's the matter with you? Oh, he says, Is that you slim? And I says, Yeah. <laughs> they all call me slim in them days. Anyway, I says, Come on, let's get you back to the ship. Okay. So we were I think it was Bayonne, New Jersey. And uh we had uh Fifteen days we were going to be in port. Each section was going to get five days. Well, he lived in Oklahoma, so uh, 
Boy, I got a call up to the exec's office. Oh my God, what did I do now? <laughs> the exec said, I don't know who in the hell Slim was, he says, but Marcus here wants to give him his five day leave. He says, you take good care of him. I, I says, I try. He says, that okay with you? He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got my 10 days instead of five, and then I could come home. Otherwise, I'd have come home. I'd have been here maybe a day and had to go right back, but he appreciated me keeping him out of trouble. <laughs> oh, boy. Do you keep in touch with any of your friends? No. Uh, he, he was, I guess, I don't know, I guess he was six, seven years older than me. He most probably isn't. Oh, I don't know, Indians live a long time sometimes, don't they? I'm 88, you know, so, or no, you didn't know, but I am. But, uh, and after you get, I'd say, past that 80th one, then things start going down the other way a little bit. Uh, mine is my knees now. I, I hurt this one several times, and I had that artificial Synvic cartilage put in there, three shots, very expensive, didn't do the job. Now the bad one is wearing out the good one. The good one's giving me a lot of trouble. And like I said, I, I could get the knee replacement, but they said I most probably couldn't do the therapy. You got to do a lot of bending and stretching, and I couldn't do it, so I got to live with it. I might get that injection in there with that. Syn, syn they call it synthetic and see if it because that knee was never hurt this one was hurt about three times did you get injured when you were on duty pardon did you get injured while you were on duty no no th thank heavens no usually if you got in the navy there was usually air aircraft or torpedoes and uh you know a lot of those guys, when that happened, they they weren't around to tell about it anymore. I mean, a lot of them got hurt, but no, we were fortunate there. Our main worry was submarines. Like I said, if it, a sub hits a DE, uh, not a sub, a, a, a torpedo hits a DE, you may as well just wipe it off. Uh, but the guys down, like us down in the room, wouldn't have to worry about them. They never get out. See, when you got GQ, everything's locked down. The hatches going down the engine room, all the watertight doors are closed. I mean, you're in your own little <laughs> section and that's it. Now, if you just uh, say something, say a torpedo would hit directly like in an engine room, it might just blow the heck out of that engine room. They might lose power on one shaft but yeah, maybe the rest of it could keep going. Cause, but these guys, they was, they was done. There was nothing you could do about them. But the water couldn't get out. In other words, the ship would not sink because of one, you know, one engine room going on. But if you hit in the right spots, well, <laughs> then they're, they're gone. Yeah. No, we were fortunate. Like I said, uh, biggest worry was submarines, and after a while, you never even had to worry about the German Messerschmitts and that anymore because once they were out of Africa, it was all in Europe, and we never, we never got to go in that direction. We went past. Uh, we was in the Mediterranean the day they invaded southern France. And the, these guys that, uh, what do you call them? They go through your mail and uh, anything that people should know, they cut out. Ah, uh, oh, there's a word for it. Think of it. <laughs> know what I'm talking In other words, if I wrote something that I wasn't supposed to, but even about weather, date, so and so, anything that the enemy could use, that wouldn't go in that letter, they would cut it out. So I wrote in one letter to my mom, I wrote her a couple times a week. You couldn't mail them, but, and we'd write them anyway when you get a chance. I wrote, if you look on our 
insurance policies, Mom, I says, today we are going past the picture on that insurance policy. Guess what that was? The Rock of Gibraltar. That's on prudential insurance policies. So she, the, the, that sensor, that's the thing. He, he never even cut that out. <laughs> oh, they cut some of the darndest stuff out. I, I, she says, boy, I don't know what you had in that letter. She says, boy, it was pretty, pretty piecemeal all the time I got it. I said, I don't think. I said, I tried to just write decent stuff. But if you just mention the wrong thing, gone. They think enemy gets a hold of it, they could, you know, figure out something from it. Yeah, censors, I'll never forget them. Uh, oh man. So that's about my life story about that. Do you have any like any new technology or Can you talk just a little louder? I don't did this you thing have, did you have any like new technology or anything that that happened during the war? Like new things that have, that they made or like war and stuff? New technology like like new guns or like new Weapon. Well, like I say, the new, no, uh, during the war, they came out with a, a better type radar. We had that put on a ship. That didn't have nothing to do with me. Uh, and I think on the submarines, our submarines, they had a better type sonar to pick up, but that didn't involve me. Anything new, uh, I don't know what it would be. Like I say, the newest thing we ever got on our ship was those, uh, they look like bombs instead of ash cans for depth charges. Oh, no, well, it ain't nothing new. But when we put the shipping commission, we had two uh, torpedo tubes on there. And uh, the first trip back from Africa, we hit port. They took those torpedo tubes off and they put what they call the quad mount. 40, that was a four millimeters. They put two of them, one on each side up on that deck. And man, those things could really spew it out. But then, next time we went to Africa, they had them all just about going out of Africa. You didn't have to worry about air power, you know, fighting the airplanes anymore. So, well, it would work if a sub would, you know, get on the surface or nothing. But they were meant strictly for any aircraft duty. I guess some of these DEs got transferred to the uh, Pacific after that. I belong to an organization called the Destroyer Escort uh, De Deca. Dest no, Destroyer Escort Sailors Association. And uh, they tell us just our news and that. And, but uh, after 500, all of those this uh, destroyer escorts was in the Pacific. Everything under 500, most of them was in the Atlantic. So altogether, if I remember correctly, during the war there was 470 of them destroyer escorts built. Hey, people, they're amazed. They, you know, they don't don't have any idea how many ships there were around. But uh, when you you take uh, say. Sometimes you'd have 50 ships in a convoy. Sometimes it was 100. And you could tell how important this stuff was to get to Africa or Europe by how many ships went. There was one time, I think we had 50 ship convoy. Instead of just being five ships protecting that, we had 10. So they wanted to protect those and get them there. And uh, if he took high test gas, that was maybe, that may be a 15 convoy. They had them an awful lot of protection. But uh, I, one of those, I saw one of them go up. That was quite a sight to see. But uh, you never had to worry about any of those guys getting over that thing. That high test gas is something else. But there was a lot of room between them, so the other ones weren't harmed from that. But that old, Submarine, he, he, that captain, that they ain't living no more, I can guarantee you. <laughs> they took care of him pretty quick. 
subs. And sometimes they'd they pull a, instead of a wolf pack three or four subs, they'd set a lone jerk out there all by himself, and he'd do whatever he could. He didn't have no way to answer to. And that was the kind that, you know, they hit them like that. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And like nowadays, they worry about people going in, you know, close to their ships and that. Remember our destroyer that they bombed? And well, like we'd you know, go over there and and uh, one of the most beautiful, I'd say it's, it's a very beautiful city, Oran. And that's where the French fleet sunk themselves in that Oran harbor. And we went in there. I mean, it's a beautiful city on the hillside, just all spread out. We were on the, over there. It was on a New Year's Eve, believe it or not. And uh, we had liberty. We got to go ashore. A lot of French people lived there. There was no war there no more. But uh, we got to go ashore, got to eat my first camel. <laughs> and he, everybody, they was buying bottles, bottles of vermouth and that which you're not supposed to head back on that ship, but <laughs> the chief electrician's mate, he got pretty full of that stuff. And at midnight, he got up there and he blew that ship's whistle and he kept it up and kept it. <laughs> he most probably woke up the whole harbor. <laughs> he couldn't figure what was going on. Oh, that was pretty funny. I laugh at that day yet. But uh, no, that's where the French fleet was. At that time, you just see the mast sticking out of the top of the water. Their battleship, I don't know if there's any battleships there, but cruisers and destroyers and that, they sunk the whole ship in that harbor. Uh, Oran, yeah. Oh, what was Oran, Bazzurdi, Casablanca, oh, Morocco. Uh, I, I can mention a whole bunch of them. I was just about every port on, on around Africa. You had to watch yourself. You went out. You always stayed two together because you couldn't trust them Arabs, Arabs, but we call them Arabs. And uh, I was talking about the destroyer that got hit. Over there, if them Arabs would come out in a canoe or something, they had somebody running around with motorboats and that. They didn't ask no questions. They were dead, I mean, on the spot. They, they didn't handle business. They knew they weren't supposed to be there. They didn't ask no questions. They were dead right now. I mean, they'd, some of them, they'd try it anyway, and it wouldn't last long. But they were always after uh, the, uh, some of them cooks and that, they were smart. They'd bag up these coffee, and they'd trade them Arabs for different stuff. And the Arabs, they would like coffee, kind of coffee grounds, and they liked the mattress covers. The mattress covers was was their dress. They cut a couple holes in it, and that and they tie a belt around it. That was yeah, mattress. Yeah, that's a fact. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, there was a guy that got got killed over there, and I don't remember. It was Bizzardi from Morocco. But I bought one of them knives. I still got that, that them Arabs, they threw about that long. Got all that wooden, little wooden handle on so each side with all kind of their stuff on them and that. But I still got it. I look, I look for some of these papers. I'd sure like to put them along. I had a, it was a form letter that everybody got them when they got out of the service. Uh, one of them signed by President Truman at that time, you know, thanking us and congratulating us. And then I had another one from, uh, uh, what's his name, Donnelly, does that sound right? The Secretary of the Navy. And I also had one, they called them ruptured ducks. It was a little gold duck on a something you wore in your lapel. I was going to bring it. I couldn't find that either. <laughs> but uh, everybody got one of them, whether you're Army, Navy, or what. Yeah, ruptured duck. That's what they call them. 
Quiet yeah. and duck. Huh? Quiet and duck. A duck? Why, why wasn't a duck? Damn, I, I can't hear worth a hoot. And it's working. It's supposed to be. Why a duck? Why was it called a ruptured duck? I don't know. That was just, just a nickname they gave it. I mean, it was just a, a duck and on a little round shield, and you just wear it in your lapel. That's what, just what they nicknamed it, ruptured duck. Every <laughs> oh, my. I have stood, I could think of all kinds of stuff most probably, but no. Um, what did you guys do to entertain yourselves whenever you had downtime? Yeah, to entertain ourselves? Yeah. Well, on our ship, <clears throat> a lot of you, you could read a lot. We had the library, and we also had the machinist mates had their poker game going in the after motor room. 23 hours and 23, how should I say that? Six days and 12 hours a week. From six in the morning on Sunday till noon, that was the church lamp was lit. You better not be I, I don't know, I don't remember if you could smoke or not. Most of all, we were down injury and we did anyway, but uh, there was no gambling going on at that time. But our assistant engineering officer, he was a prude. He didn't approve of that gambling. But he couldn't say nothing because Lieutenant Wickard, our engineering officer, he would play poker with us. But when you get everything done as you're supposed to do in the first room. Sometime there was a couple games going. The after motor room was the quietest spot of the whole works. All the things was back there was where the shafts went out the rear end of the ship. Maybe well, not much else. Nice floor. <laughs> 24 hours a day. One bunch had to go stand watch. Next bunch take home. Oh yeah, I played a few games of poker back there myself. And, uh, but uh, a lot of guys played cribbage. I think that's coming back. They got a club here in Washington now. But uh, you couldn't gamble just anywhere on the ship. I mean, uh, I know there was other places they did it, but I know when, and there was nobody got in but engineers in ours. They, nobody else was accepted, so. I'm sure the other ones had places where they played too, but it kept you occupied. It was, oh man, you get, you just make millions, you know, nickel and dime limit. <laughs> you could play for hours sometime, maybe you lose five to ten dollars. But uh, you know, I played a, I played a lot of cribbage. I had a, our secretary of the engineering force was. He was a cribbage nut. He'd call me up and know if I'm doing anything. <laughs> He'd close his door in his office and we'd sit in there and play cribbage. Oh, that'd keep. <laughs> He'd do it some other time. <laughs> but that's about all you had fun to do. Yeah, I mean, you didn't get off too many days when you hit a port. Sometimes you got liberty and sometimes not. When I got out, uh, I don't know how many days I owed. You're supposed to get, uh, I forget how many days a year, but we never got them naturally. So I was married, and when I got married, we never had a refrigerator. We had an ice box, believe it or not. Here I got this check from the government for so many days of unused leave it was mounted to $89. I went down Auto and Company and bought a refrigerator. No kidding, but I guess see, I got married in 48. This must have been sometime in 49 or 50. But I got out of the service on Christmas Eve of 45, so it took that long. But anyway, we got paid for that. I've been a member, life member down here, life member, but I've been a member down here for 67 years. Yeah, yeah. And if I live so long, wife and I, 
a will be married 65 years in September. But uh, you have to thank the good Lord for that kind of stuff. Yep. I told the wife, I said, boy, we're living on borrowed time. I said, we better go out and do everything we can. <laughs> yeah, she said, you like me? She says, neither one of us can kick very high anymore. <laughs> I kick kind of high. Uh, no, my biggest problem is I haven't got any balance. I, that's, uh, I broke my leg at, here in, in town, and I got an infection in it, and it gave me uh, all these massive doses of uh, a drug called genomycin. Well, it saved my leg, but it also ruined my balance and helped mess my ears up the rest of the way. But I'm still here. That's the main thing. And I had my physical Tuesday. Yeah, he says you're still living, so I guess, guess I am. <laughs> you look alive to me. Yeah, oh yeah, I love life. I feed the birds. I live on a farm. I, I, I miss running around on a farm. I can't do that anymore. I used to every day when I retired, I'd take the dogs and go for a different run on and one day I tried that. I had two canes. One cane hit a hole. I didn't think that thing was ever going to stop. <laughs> so why well, says that's enough of that? No, I had walkie-talkie and uh, tell her where I was going, which direction. But even so, that's now I'm happy. I went. Uh, you called me up, or I was going to call you to cancel Saturday. I had a date before you. I had a, my great grandson's birthday party in down the city, and then you called me, and I thought, "Oh, that saved me." <laughs> so uh, this worked out real good. And uh, I got four great grandkids; they're all boys, so they'll carry my name on a few years. I guess. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, there's something. So. I don't know anything else that I can tell you, except I'm happy I'm alive. I hope I live to be a hundred. I'm happy you're alive too. Pardon? And I said I'm happy you're alive too. I, if I had a drink right now, I'd I'd, be, I'd say to many more years, Mr. Bowles. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't. I can get you something to drink, but I'm afraid no, nothing else. No, no. <laughs> no, I mean if you want a soda or something, I can get you something. Oh um, no, no, thank you. No. Are we finished? I think so, unless oh. you have anything else to add. No. I, uh, I went on. Is this anything to do with Honor Flight? Um, partly. We're doing a inter we're interviewing for um, the Historical Society. See, uh, one of the gals called up, and I told her, I said, oh, I hate like heck to do it. I said, I'd have to walk a half a mile to high school and that. And then I was talking to uh, <clears throat> This lady up here at State Farm, and her sister, uh, Miss Pazinius, is a teacher at the high school. She's our teacher. She's okay, teacher. so she gave her name to her, my name to her, and I says, "Well, I says maybe I can meet her somewhere." She says she didn't know, so, okay, she's your teacher. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I knew her sister Joni for many, many years. I knew their dad for many, many years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sooner or later in this town, you know just about everybody, or used to, not anymore. Boy, I'm president of the Rural Fire Association. We got 2,200 members. Oh and used to, I was an electrician all my life. I owned Washington Electric. Before that, I worked for Stretker Electric and Triplett. But anyway, I just about knew everybody because when I grew up, I was a kid. I had paper route. I get up early in the morning. I used to say mass. I served mass down at the old hospital, if you know where that is, where Mercy Doctors Building is now. They had a chapel in there with all the sisters. Then I started setting up pins. I knew I knew just about everybody in town. Everybody at that time knew me too, but they don't know my right name, Harry. Everybody. Lefty. That's why I said Harry Lefty. That's on everything. But now I'm president of the Rural Association. 
I guess I've been president for the last 15 years. We just got our latest piece of equipment out there, Station 5 at Crockle. It's a utility truck, and uh, they carry all the necessities like uh, uh, defib and the jaws of life, anything you need, brooms, mops, anything. They go out on a farm and they take care of it. About five years ago, I got a guy to donate almost three acres of land out on uh, why, why and Sunny Road for a new station. We need one out there. And then when the economy went to heck, no chance of getting it, but we got the land. I don't think I'll ever get to see the building because money's still tight with the people around town. As soon as you, they found that out with the school bond, I said, they, the people, they, they, it didn't cost them nothing. They passed that one. The second one, it didn't. I mean, I don't. I'm not. I'm in Union School District. Believe it or not, in Clover Bottom. But uh, I think they made a mistake right now, doing all that work up there, spending all that money. The people are going to say, "Man, they got all that money to spend." And then they wanted to pass this bond issue. The next one, they'll be against it again. Believe me. There's always a certain percentage against it before you even start. But then there's certain things that turn people in the other, other direction. I, I mean, I done heard a couple of them say that. My God, ain't got money to do this, and then they can spend a million up there on that track. I know. Huh? I know. They, there is a lot of people. They, they can't see it. They thought that track wasn't that bad. could have been patched. I don't know. I, I wasn't ever on that path, on that track. But it must have been, the bleachers must have been bad. They were falling apart. I don't know. It's a funny world. It is. And everybody thinks a little different. And everybody thinks with that, that billfold and nowadays. I mean, uh, if you got kids in school, they all fart. But after... They haven't got them there anymore, then things, you know, change a little bit. Well, if anything else I can answer you, I'd be willing. I don't think so. You covered it all. Like, you, like okay. you're awesome. I was, like, worried. I was so nervous. I was like, oh, no, I'm going to be, like, so awkward. And my question, I'm going to ask so many questions. And he's going to be like, yeah. this doesn't apply. But you, like, yeah. you just, like, fire it out. Oh. In other words, you cut out of there what you don't want, huh? No, we, I don't think we're going to cut anything out. What? I don't think we'll cut anything out. You have oh. a really good interview. <laughs> okay. Well, so any, what, where is this going to end up now? Histori Washington Historical Society. At where? The Washington Historical Society. No kidding. Yeah, you're going to be famous. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, this lady had called me up from the honor flight. 